We'll come to order. Good morning and thank you for being here today. Anytime we give our children or grandchildren's medicine like this bottle of children's Tylenol that was included in the recall, we expect it to be safe and we expect it to help the children get better not create problems for them. When questions are raised about whether children's medicine is safe, parents need immediate answers. Almost every household in this country has these children's products in their medicine cabinets. And everyone has the same question this morning. Are these products safe? And what are we doing to ensure the safety and to make certain that this does not happen again. While we, didn't, we do not want to cause unnecessary alarm, we also cannot ignore the troubling fact before us. Less than a month ago, a Johnson & Johnson company known as McNeil Consumer Healthcare recalled over 40 variations of children's medicines, including such widely used products as children's Tylenol, children's Motrin, children's Benadryl, Tylenol, and infant's drops. This recall was carried out because of production problems at McNeil that affected the quality, purity, and potency of the medicine. McNeil received dozens of consumer complaints about foreign particles and children's medicine, which were later confirmed by McNeil. In addition, tests at the plant showed that three batches of infants' Tylenol were found to be superpotent, meaning that they contain an overdose of the active ingredient. McNeil's productions of children's medicine was shut down by the company, and a month later it still is shut down. The FDA is currently investigating any possible links between the recall medicine and adverse health effects on children who took that medicine. The FDA is also currently reviewing reports of children who died to determine if there is any connection between those deaths and this recall. At this point, the FDA is not aware of any connections between the recall of medicine and the death of any child. One document the committee received from the FDA refers to the case of a year and a half one-and-a-half-year-old girl who died. That document reads, the coroner's office called to report the death of a one-and-a-half-year-old female that is suspected to be related to a Tylenol product. Just last night, the committee obtained from the FDA even more disturbing information. According to an FDA document, McNeil knew there was a potential problem with one of its Motrin products that was on the market in 2008. But rather than issue a recall, McNeil allegedly sent contractors out to the stores to buy the products back and told the stores not to mention a recall. After the FDA confronted McNeil about this, McNeil officially enacted a recall of, uh, on the affected products. If true, this phantom recall attempt by McNeil could have endangered the public and it warrants further investigation by this committee. We need to know that health risks are associated with this recall. We need to know whether this is an isolated issue a part of a widespread problem with the safety and production of children's medicine at McNeil. We need to know that Johnson and Johnson is what Johnson and Johnson is doing uh, to get to the bottom of this. And we need to know what the FDA is doing to ensure the safety of children's medicine and whether the FDA has the resources it needs to carry out its mission. But Johnson and Johnson and the FDA will be asked very difficult questions today. And I hope they are prepared to give us the answers that will assure safety 
of these medications. This is our first hearing on this issue, but there may be more. We will follow this road until we have all the answers and the questions that are raised by the people are answered. There is nothing this committee will investigate that is more serious than the health of our children. I can assure you that as chairman of this committee, and I know on this matter I also speak for the ranking member, when I say this, we will use all of our authority to find out what went wrong and do everything that we can to ensure that it does not happen again. On this note, I yield to five minutes to the ranking member of the committee, the Congressman Issa from the great state of California. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are right. You speak for both of us when you say we will use all efforts of this committee and all power of this committee to ensure this does not happen again. Johnson & Johnson has owned the McNeil Consumer Health Care Division since 1959. So for one, from this day forward, I will say Johnson & Johnson and not talk about a subsidiary that has been owned by a company for so long. Before I came to the Congress, I was a manufacturer. I understand ISO 9001, certainly a, a good but lesser standard than what we expect medical procedure, uh, medical items and food items to be held to. But there is no question that my manufacturing techniques were less than I would have expected if I were going to put a product in my mouth. Producing electronics, you want it to work, and you want it to work reliably. You want it to work consistently, and you want it to never hurt anyone. But my company knew that we would produce product that from time to time would be installed poorly. We knew that from time to time we would have a bad transistor, resistor, or diode. We did not produce to aviation specs because, to be honest, an alarm going off because of a malfunction was less of a problem. But today we're talking about a market leader, a leader who had so much confidence of the American people that we never questioned their products or their services, whose creed was all about safety and reliability, and they have disappointed us. We are not the Committee of Manufacturing. We are not the Committee of Jurisdiction directly over health care products or, for that matter, any of the manufacturing sector in this country. That is for other committees. What we are is the committee that oversees government's overseeing of its responsibility. Today we have before us the FDA. And much like the uh, National Transportation Safety and other parts of the Department of Transportation, we have an agency who has done their job. They have delivered report after report of problems. And they have come to a final conclusion before coming to this committee of a massive recall. So like Akio Toyota, we would hope that Johnson & Johnson comes ready to say this is a mistake that will not happen again, that the company will in fact change how it does business so significantly as to never be before us again. But as to the FDA, I am encouraged that they have done their job, but I am disappointed that it took so long. As, as with the national transportation questions that we had before Secretary LaHood, Today, I will be interested to know what changes at FDA would allow for, if you will, shortcuts to this conclusion. How do we find that a manufacturing technique that is below standard is corrected more quickly? How do we ensure that there are no backdoor or, if you will, unannounced recalls? And how do we ensure that the FDA has all of the authority and financing that it needs to ensure the American people that not just a 120-year-old company, well-regarded and able to pay for all the cost of their mistakes, but that every piece of over-the-counter or prescription medicine or, for that matter, food, whether domestic or foreign import, as so much is today, is safe? I'm deeply concerned, Mr. Chairman, that Johnson & Johnson is the tip of the iceberg. If one of the most reliable and responsible organizations in America and a company with great connections to the community can fail us, 
then what about those aspirins and other products that are more and more being imported from outside our country, from factories that are harder to reach and people who do not even uh, speak our language when we go to inspect them? So although today is about Johnson & Johnson, and I hope the second panel does their, their job of explaining why they'll not be in front of us again, I am most in interested in the first panel. What do we need to do as the Committee on Oversight and Reform to ensure that you're able to do your job worldwide safely so the American people can sleep knowing that these kinds of medicines, no matter where they're made in the world, will be absolutely safe from this day forward? I thank the Chairman and yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman from California for his um, uh, statement. And of course, I want you to know that uh, I agree with you. Uh, I would like to just recognize um, the Brooklyn Friends School who's here. You know, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Could you please stand up? Yeah. Brooklyn. You can't be recognized when you're just, there we go. Yeah. Brooklyn Friends School, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to our first witness, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. He is our witness today from the FDA, but he is accompanied by Deborah Otter and Michael Chappell, who will not be making opening statements, but are here to provide any additional expertise that may be helpful to the committee. Deborah Otter is the Director of the Office of Compliance at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration, and Michael Chappell is the Acting Associate Commissioner for regulatory affairs at the FDA. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand while I minister the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. May be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Dr. Sharfstein, well, we've been the only person making an opening statement, so let okay. me start with you. Great. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having this hearing. I am Joshua Sharfstein, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I'm a pediatrician, and I'm the former Health Commissioner of Baltimore, Maryland. I want to talk to you about what happened at McNeil, what FDA has done, and I want to answer your questions. I am joined, as you mentioned, by Deb Otter, who is also a former prosecutor at the Department of Justice and a finalist for the Service to America Medal, and by Mike Chappell, who is a 38-year veteran of FDA. The FDA has authority in, uh, over drug manufacturing both to enforce general good manufacturing practice requirements and to require companies to comply with their own rules. McNeil Consumer Healthcare makes a variety of over-the-counter products for the U.S. market from four manufacturing facilities in the United States and Canada. Over the last several years, FDA has had growing concerns about the quality of the company's manufacturing process reflected in unsatisfactory inspections and recalls. FDA inspected the company's facilities with an increased frequency, and in February 2010, the agency convened the management of its parent company, Johnson & Johnson to express concern about a pattern of noncompliance. This is a story of an agency that identified a problem, confronted a company, and eventually forced major changes to protect the public. i now like to walk you through some of the key events. Prior to 2009, FDA investigators identified several problems with good manufacturing practices at facilities run by McNeil. These problems included laboratory controls, equipment cleaning processes, and a failure to investigate identified problems. The company generally fixed these problems and the agency inspected the firm regularly. At its Fort Washington facility, McNeil makes a wide variety of over-the-counter products, including a large number of over-the-counter liquid products for children. In May of, and June of 2009, FDA identified several violations, including McNeil's failure to meet its own standard for quality in one of its ingredients in over-the-counter liquids. McNeil's standard for this ingredient, known as microcrystalline cellulose, required that there be no gram-negative bacteria. 
Mino purchased the cellulose in partial lots that had not tested positive for this objectionable bacteria, but the vendor had tested other partial lots from the same master lot and had found a certain bacteria called Percoldia cepacea. According to its standards, McNeil should not have used any of the partial lots from this master lot. In reviewing the situation, FDA scientists at the time concluded that the risk to the public was remote. All of the drums that, that were used had tested negative for the bacteria. All the final product had tested negative, and FDA agreed with the company's assessment that this bacteria would be very unlikely to grow in the final product. Yet because the company had not kept to its standard, it represented a significant violation of manufacturing practices, and the company initiated a recall of almost 8 million bottles of finished product. A few months later, in Puerto Rico, where McNeil makes a large number of over-the-counter pills for the U.S. market, FDA became aware that the company had received reports of products from this facility having a musty odor. Yet McNeil had not fully investigated these reports for about a year and did not notify FDA despite the requirements that such reports be referred to the agency within three days. FDA inspectors urged McNeil to conduct a complete investigation, which eventually identified the source of the odor to be a chemical called TBA, which was in the air because of a pesticide used on the wood of the pallets to store empty medication bottles. McNeil initiated a series of recalls as the scope of the problem became clear. The risk to the public by this problem included potential temporary, non-serious reactions, including nausea, stomach pain, vomiting, and possibly diarrhea. Very little is known about this chemical called TBA, but in the small quantities transferred to the products, it was not thought to pose a serious risk for long-term health problems. On January 15, 2010, FDA issued a warning letter expressing serious concerns about the company's control over the quality of its products and the company's failure to aggressively investigate and correct quality problems. FDA noted in this public warning letter that neither upper management at Johnson & Johnson nor McNeil had assured timely investigation and resolution of the issues. On February 19, 2010, in the wake of that warning letter, senior compliance staff from FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation Research and the field organization called a meeting with senior officials from McNeil and its parent company, Johnson & Johnson. Attendees included the president of McNeil, the company group chairman for over-the-counter drugs at Johnson & Johnson, as a well as a number of quality assurance executives from both companies. This was an extraordinary meeting. FDA requested that senior officials from Johnson & Johnson attend the meeting over the heads of the McNeil executives so they would be on notice regarding FDA's rising concerns about whether McNeil's corporate culture supported a robust quality of system to ensure the purity, potency, and safety of its products. FDA raised concerns about multiple recalls, based on the recent inspections and expressed concern that there was a pattern of failure to report material information to FDA in a timely manner. FDA told the company that significant immediate steps were needed to address issues of compliance and quality. We learned that the company was taking major steps to address these issues, but we told them we would not take their word for it. They would expect close oversight um, ongoing. In April, FDA returned to the McNeil's facility um, in Fort Washington. This was an inspection that was scheduled sooner than usual because of the history of compliance problems. Days before the inspectors arrived, McNeil shut down manufacturing because of particulates found in a number of liquid medications, including acetaminophen, cellulose, nickel, and chromium. We identified a range of violations, including failure to meet its own specifications for bacteria and particulates and for one Tylenol product, the possibility of higher than inspected concentrations of Tylenol. In reviewing the situation, FDA scientists concluded the risk posed to the public by these problems was remote. We did not find evidence that we need to use raw materials, that its tests found to be positive for bacterial contamination, and that all finished lots tested negative. The particles would be expected to pass through the gastrointestinal tract, and while there was a potential for higher concentrations of Tylenol per dropper, none of the final products tested with, safe, uh, tested with high levels. Although the public health risk from these quality problems is low, these problems should never have occurred, and the manufacturing failures at the facility that caused them were unacceptable. Following requirements assures that products are consistent in their safety and effectiveness, and failure to follow these procedures risks more serious problems and undermines consumer confidence. On April 30th, McNeil announced a voluntary recall of over 136 million bottles of liquid 
infants, and children's products. The agency is now closely monitoring the implementation of a corrective action plan that includes changes to, to McNeil's quality system, organizational changes, and senior management oversight. FDA will take steps to ensure that when this facility begin man, begins to manufacture again, it will be able to produce safe products. We are also considering additional enforcement actions against the company, which may include seizure, injunction, and criminal penalties. I wanted just to say uh, one word about adverse events. It is understandable that many Americans hearing about these large recalls are wondering whether or not their children were put at risk. In assessing this question, FDA considers two sources of information. First, our assessment of the manufacturing problems themselves, and second, adverse event reports to the agency. As I discussed earlier, FDA analyzed the various manufacturing problems. Based on the circumstances in each case, our experts believe the risk for any child in the United States was remote. We also looked and are looking at adverse event reports reported to the agency. We receive these reports and often request and review medical records, coroner reports, and other supplementary data sources. In one case, we had a report of a six-year-old uh, child uh, where the, the uh, child died as a result of an infection for, from Bercoldia cepacea, the same bacteria that was found in the lot of the ingredient. FDA actually got a hold of the medications used by this child and tested them, and we conducted extra inspections to see whether there was a connection between this death and the product. Um, in fact, the, the, all the samples tested negative, and FDA believed that there was not a connection in that particular case. When we have adequate information, we review the reports to determine what role, if any, the medication played in the development of an adverse event. We can find the medication had no role in the adverse event, that the activity as a drug could cause a serious side effect, or that a quality problem may have contributed to the outcome. So far, um, FDA does recognize that some of the reports may reflect the side effects of the medications, but we have no cases with evidence that a product quality problem contributed to a significant adverse health outcome for children. We are continuing to receive information about certain cases, and we will update the public and the committee should our assessment change. Let me close by noting that every investigation presents an opportunity to, for FDA to improve our effectiveness in protecting public health. In this case, uh, we have learned more about the importance of corporate structure for compliance. When we do not get a response that we're comfortable with from a subsidiary, FDA will not hesitate, as we did not in this case, to go over their heads to the corporate parents. FDA will be developing new procedures to use what we learn at one facility in guiding our inspections of other facilities run by the same company. We have also gained experience with two issues that we're working on at the agency, how to improve our recall process and how to strengthen enforcement. FDA Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg has called for FDA's enforcement to be vigilant, strategic, quick, and visible. A range of activities are underway at the agency to bring this vision to reality, including strengthening our criminal enforcement of FDA's laws. We, are, we will continue to work with Congress to secure additional authority to assist us. Let me just uh, mention, in this regard, we believe that transparency in our enforcement activities is very important, um, both so people can see what we're doing and to, to, to make sure that we're accountable. And as part of our new program performance effort at FDA called FDA Track, we are, we are going to be posting monthly the numbers of different kinds of enforcement actions that FDA is taking. And as part of our transparency task force, we have proposed making public every inspection, when it's happening, and what the outcome of that inspection is. We're getting public comment on that. I would end by saying that this episode reminds us that a vigilant FDA is essential to drug safety in the United States. FDA inspectors identified serious problems at McNeil, called the company to account, and, and forced major changes to protect the public. On behalf of the many FDA staff who worked on and are continuing to work on this issue, I appreciate the opportunity to make this statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharfstein, for your uh, statement. Let me just begin by saying this. The FDA need more enforcement authority or funding to be able to respond to issues like this recall? I mean, or... Um, thank you. I think that um, it's instructive to, to think about the food safety bill a little bit, because in the food safety bill there's some provisions that um, uh, Congress is looking at granting the FDA over food that we don't currently have over drugs. And those include um, uh, 
authority to require certain types of quality systems and preventive controls, mandatory recall authority, um, access to records um, by companies, and uh, civil money penalties. So th those are some areas where we don't have a position at this point, it hasn't worked its way through the system. Uh, with respect to drugs, I, I would point those out, that those are in the food safety bill. The administration is supporting those for foods. Right. Let me ask this. Can you say with complete certainty that no children who took the medicine that were recalled last month were harmed by them? No, I cannot say that with complete certainty. I think what we're continuing to get information, and there were remote risks that were potentially possible. But from what we know, we do not have evidence at this point of children who did have serious problems. But because there was a remote risk, it was the right thing to do to do the recall. Right. But you're still looking at, uh, are you still looking to see in terms of whether or not this occurred? That's correct. We are. And there, there are certain reports that we've gotten that we're in the process of um, thoroughly reviewing. There's, how serious were the problems at, at McNeil's plant in Fort Washington that the FDA most recently discovered? How serious were they? I think as manufacturing uh, problems go, they were serious. They, there was a range of different problems. They had um, not responded to the complaints that they'd gotten of particulates in the product. They um, had missed um, the fact that some of the, uh, their, their ingredients came from a lot that had had contamination, even though the previous year they knew this to be a, an issue. Um, there were a wide range of findings that indicated to us that there were serious manufacturing quality problems at the facility. Right. What went wrong that caused one of the largest makers of children's medicine to recall millions? You know, is it quality control? What do you think that uh, might have happened here? Well, I think that that's a great question, and it can be answered at different levels. I think one level you answer it is exactly like you said, it's quality control, that there were quality control problems. At another level, you have to ask, why? Why did a company with the reputation and record of, of McNeil and Johnson & Johnson have those quality control problems? And um, we think that, uh, that that's a very important question for, for you to be looking at. It's something we need to understand better. We think it may relate to the uh, corporate compliance and corporate structure. And we, we note that the company has made major changes in that when we confronted them with a very serious compliance problem that they were having. Could you sort of describe to us what you're doing now to work with Johnson & Johnson to make sure that they correct the problems that exist? Sure. Well, the, the, this facility in Fort Washington is now not manufacturing. Um, there is a complete plan for standing it back up that the company is going to be presenting to FDA. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we have a very good cooperation from the company now that they're really looking for the agency's seal of approval before they uh, get going, and I'm sure you'll hear that from them um, on the next panel. And in addition, to what we're working on there, we are also reviewing the record and considering whether other um, types of enforcement actions are appropriate. Right. Dr. Sharfstein, um, tell me what the FDA believes McNeil did as described in these FDA documents that we receive. Uh, can you say that again? On I'm screen. sorry. You're on the screen, Dot. Oh, I see. You're on the screen. What do we believe actually happened here? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is something that um, is troubling to the agency. Um, I'm not sure we know it, the, the, the complete full story, but it, basically there, were, um, there was a problem with how Motrin uh, tablets uh, dissolve and whether or not patients would get the right dose. And um, the company notified FDA that we would be, um, let's pull this out. That, that they were going to be evaluating whether there was a product on the shelves to recall. And then we were alerted, uh, I believe, by the, uh, one of the state boards of pharmacy that instead of just looking to see whether or not um, there was medication to recall, the company had, had, had a contractor that was going out and trying to buy up um, all the medicine when they went into the store and the information said you should simply act like a regular customer while making these purchases. There must be no mention of this being a recall of the product. 
If asked, simply state your employer is checking the distribution chain of this product and needs to have some of it purchased for the pro project. I don't think we really, you know, fully understood exactly what was going on. It, it was troubling to us, and when FDA found out about this, we insisted that an actual recall occur. And it, we, we did think that it, it reflected poorly on the company, and it was one of the things that FDA brought to their attention during this uh, extraordinary meeting that happened in February. Right. Thank you. After the recall, FDA recommended consumers buy drugstore alternatives for their children. The vast majority of those drugstores products are made by Perigo, a company in Michigan that has had ongoing quality control problems. When was the last time FDA inspected the plant in Michigan that makes infants and children products? You know when it was inspected last? Um, I do. Um, I may ask uh, Deb Otter to uh, answer that because she um, uh, oversees the um, compliance efforts at the Center for Drugs. I believe there were several inspections in the last couple of years. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't have the exact dates here, but there have been several inspections in the last few years. Um, I believe there have been two in 2010, but I would have to double check those facts. I but you agree with the fact there have been some issues with quality control? Yes, there have been some issues at Perigo. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I yield to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Arthur, I'd, I'd like to follow up. Is it appropriate for the FDA to recognize, rep, rep, to recommend an alternative at all? Is that uh, basically, if you say don't do that or baby doctor if yeah. you'd prefer, it, isn't, it, isn't it really appropriate for the FDA to simply deal with its knitting and say don't take that and not intervene in, in alternatives? Well, the challenge is, I, I, I think I, I know there's an irresistible urge to answer people's questions. I, I'm in that business, but uh, yeah. but isn't it, in fact, inappropriate for any government entity to make a recommendation unless it's an authorized recommendation? It doesn't appear as though there's any mandate for that. I think Dr. Hamburg and I see FDA as a public health agency that has to be responsive to the needs of clinicians and patients. And it very frequently happens that there's a shortage of one medication, and we have a whole shortage team that works with um, manufacturers and professional societies to give recommendations in the event of a shortage for what can be used as an alternative. I think it's wrong to say this brand is, is the right one to okay. use, but when people don't know what is available for the FDA to say, we want you to know this medication is available and is a potential alternative, I think that's information that the clinical community really wants to hear from FDA. We have another, um, for example. Um, and I have no problem with the mm -hmm. clinical community. When you speak doctors to doctors, I certainly appreciate that. I, my only question was, you know, where is the line? I think all of us want to know where is the line when it's ultimately to the public, to the uninformed public. Uh, you know, you're, as you said, a brand name would be inappropriate, but uh, a chemical de description, I gather, is what you're saying would be uh, appropriate, which would cover potentially multiple brands. Right. Okay. Uh, Ms. Arthur, one that I know falls more squarely on you. Uh, in this case, I don't want you to say you have an investigation or you don't, but is there a potential criminal liability for some of the acts that went on? I think what I can say at this point is that the uh, Center for Drugs has referred this to FDA's criminal uh, investigative unit, and then they have to judge where to go from there. Okay. I will take that as a yes, that there is at least the potential and that, that everyone who is out there providing food and drugs should be aware that the scenario we just saw in the future, or perhaps in this case, could lead to criminal actions uh, or, you know, uh, indictments. Uh, at least that that's the, 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 not saying in this case, but that that should be fair warning to people who are watching this hearing. And I think, as Dr. Sharfstein said, the agency is working to uh, increase our enforcement on the criminal side and to uh, connect carefully what we do on the criminal side with what we do on the civil side so that we can maximize the effectiveness of those tools. And, and yes, I, doctor. I, I think that's an, an excellent point. We, we very much want to send that message. Um, Dr. Hamburg, the commissioner, gave a major address on enforcement where she called on companies to be, uh, make sure they had excellent compliance programs. And just this week, someone sent me an uh, email about a, a course 
and report that is being marketed where it says um, bigger, tougher, faster, preparing for the new FDA. When the inspector comes calling, will you be ready? And it is all about sending a message to industry. This is within industry, they're marketing this, that FDA is significantly strengthening its oversight and companies have to learn how to put quality systems in place. This is the kind of thing we like to see. We, want, we, we don't um, like to see these kinds of recalls. We like to see compliance, that's our goal. And seeing the industry really coming together, getting the message, that, that, that's uh, very important to us. Uh, now, Doctor, uh, your, your being here today goes far beyond uh, the McNeil Division of Johnson & Johnson. So let me ask a, a slightly different question. In the ordinary course, you try to visit uh, facilities here in the U.S. once every two years. But more and more uh, non-prescription drugs are being produced in China and other very far away places. Uh, and those places, in many cases, have a standard of simply lying on their paperwork. We've had that in, in a number of other areas. How do you propose that the FDA be able to ensure that a foreign manufacturer in a country where we have a fairly opaque ability to go beyond what the papers presented at the factory, that we can rely on those test results and as such the medicine that comes from them? Uh, it's an Excellent question. Um, the safety of imports is extremely important to us, and uh, Dr. Hamburg has addressed, uh, has raised these very similar sorts of concerns in some major speeches. And we had a hearing in the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on on Health not too long ago where this got a fair amount of attention. Um, it's a concern for us, and there are certain things that we need to be able to do better. Um, uh, included among those is holding each person in the supply chain accountable, um, and that there are some tools that would allow us to do that. Um, in addition, we need to significantly expand our coordination with other agencies. We now have two foreign offices in China that um, coordinate with other agencies. And um, for example, if Australia does an inspection that we have confidence in, then we can go to another plant in Australia can have confidence in that inspection. Um, we also uh, need to strengthen and work. So you, what you're saying is your, part of your procedure would be to learn to inspect the inspectors to qualify countries or inspection techniques so that we could be somewhat reciprocal. That's absolutely true, both for our kind of uh, major partners um, in the developed world, but also we want to strengthen the um, indigenous uh, inspecting capacity, and there's a big effort to do that in countries like China and India. Yeah, so me, it, it is a multi, yeah. it's a very complex right. problem, and, and there are a lot of solutions. Let me just ask one final question, and if it goes long, I'd ask that it be answered for the record. Every day, 45-foot, 53-foot containers of non-prescription drugs come in the country. Currently, uh, our import authorities open only a fraction of those containers, and when they do, they open them to see if it's an aspirin and not much more. Do you believe here today that the Congress should begin creating both the authority and the mandate for at least sample inspection of 100 percent of these types of imports if they come from countries that you have not certified the certifiers? I believe that um, Congress and the FDA need to work together to really address the question of import safety. I'm not sure 100 percent testing is the answer. I think we need to have 100 percent accountability across the supply chain and a strong import border presence, but it's got to be addressed comprehensively. Okay, well, I would like you to answer for the record then the, the, the key question of if it comes from a country in which you not, have not achieved that level of confidence, no part of the supply chain, chain can change the fact that if any one of those bottles is bad and there has been no sampling, you will not have that public confidence. So I'd like you to tell us how you're going to get that confidence if you didn't get it in the country of origin mm -hmm. and now it's sitting in a container in the U.S. or going through the supply chain. And I'd ask you to answer that for the record. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Charf Singh, it's very good to see you again. And I say this without reservation, uh, when you served as the Health Commissioner for Baltimore, where I live, uh, you did an outstanding job. You did it with excellence and integrity. And I have full faith and confidence in you. And so I wanted to say that before I got into these questions. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. There appears, Dr. Sharpstein, as I listen to your testimony, that uh, McNeil was involved in a culture of mediocrity. 
it seems that the that the FDA had one standard and McNeil had another and I'm trying to figure out where the two meet in other words we talk about um, it sounds like a standard of McNeil they said okay we got a little taint here a little problem there but we'll still mix it up it'll be all right FDA says no that's not good enough where does that I mean and 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 then you said something that was very interesting you said there might be a need to uh, take further action you said further action may be required I'm trying to figure out how that all comes together when you've got a company that seems to be over and over again be it by negligence mm -hmm. intent greed or whatever skirting the system but you got the FDA saying we've got the standard I mean where how does that work? How does that come together? You follow sure. what I'm saying? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, there's a real parallel to Baltimore because in Baltimore we inspected restaurants at the health department and um, we would uh, sometimes find problems and it, you know, there's always a balance between cooperation, working cooperatively with a business and taking action. And most of the time we would find a problem and the business would jump and fix it and then we were done. But every so often there was a, a restaurant that we would have a significant problem with. We eventually got to the point where for some people we took away their license to run a restaurant in Baltimore, their ability to do that. And it's a balance. And I think if you look at the, this experience with McNeil, you see that, that the FDA is pointing things out. Uh, McNeil is uh, sort of correcting them, waiting a little bit of time in some cases to tell us about problems. And over time, FDA is ratcheting up the oversight like we would do in Baltimore where we would say wait a second you know this should have been corrected in a restaurant and we're gonna have to go back again and eventually we're gonna have to bring them in and eventually we're gonna bring them to the administrative judge that's basically what FDA is doing and the, the story of this whole episode is that FDA you know increased the pressure increased the pressure brought in the corporate executives and wound up forcing I think you'll hear very major changes in the company's approach to quality we are going to use this as an opportunity to see what you know we can improve well, let but, me, uh, let me but I think you. overall it, it is a tough balance that that the FDA has to strike let me ask you this in your testimony you state that in February 2010 FDA took the extraordinary extraordinary step you said mm -hmm. a meeting with the management of Johnson Johnson to express uh, your concern about a pattern of non-compliance why was this meeting considered so extraordinary? What was extraordinary about it were two things. First of all, we went over the heads of the whole company. I mean, McNeil is a pretty big company, but we went to the actual, you know, corporate central head of the entire major company to to um, to express this concern. Um, so that, that's, that's one reason why it's extraordinary. The second thing is it wasn't about. Usually, we meet about specific problems, and this was a meeting about a culture of compliance that we'd seen so many problems at different facilities and problems that really concerned us that we really were calling them on their whole quality system and it led to major changes I think you'll hear at the company they you know um, people were moved in their positions or removed from their positions they have a whole new layer I believe you'll hear and um, I think that those were the two things that made it extraordinary that we went over their heads and that we talked about the culture of compliance at the company not just individual problems. Now how did Johnson & Johnson react to what you said? They were present at the meeting were they not? They was, were. Okay. Yes. And wh what was their reaction? I, I believe that my understanding is that they took it quite seriously. They, they heard that FDA that this was not a usual kind of meeting for the FDA to have um, they'd gotten one of the fastest warning letters ever from what happened in Puerto Rico. Um, we, we issued a warning letter in which we call, the warning letter itself mentioned the fact that there was a failure of oversight by not just McNeil and Johnson and Johnson and I think based on the changes they committed to at that point we, we got the sense that, that, that they'd heard our concern um, although we, we made very clear that we weren't going to take their word for it. And what does all of this say about a corporation? I mean, all of, you, you, I mean apparently you, you've gone pretty far with this corporation. What does it say about this corporation? I mean have you drawn a conclusion? Well, you know, most of the companies that FDA deals with do um, do comply, and you know, there are some great examples out there of terrific compliance programs. This is a company that had a major problem with compliance, and it, it was a, a a problem that crossed different domains, different facilities, and was a systematic problem at the company. That that's something FDA needs to be able to identify and address. 
um, with the company, with its, with its uh, you know, um, senior leadership. And uh, we have to be willing, and in this case, I think we did really call them to account for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield um, five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chafee. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, in a moment, uh, Ms. Groggins is going from uh, Johnson & Johnson is about to testify, and in her written testimony she says, quote, the health risks to consumers from the recalled products were remote, end quote. Is that true or false, and from your opinion? I think that is uh, also FDA's uh, understanding right now. Next uh, thing she says, second, McNeil, McNeil has no indication of a serious adverse medical event caused by any of the issues referenced in the recalled announcement. In your opinion, is that accurate? Um, well, I, I can't speak to what McNeil knows. The FDA does not have evidence of that kind of severe um, uh, event, although we're continuing to investigate certain cases. She says, quote, third, no raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of McNeil's pediatric products, end quote. Is that true or? I'd say that, that's sort of true maybe with an asterisk. Sort of true? Yeah, with an, you know, I would say. Or, sort of true? W w w you know, with a footnote, the footnote being they did use raw materials from lots that had tested positive. There were some negative tests. Um, for the parts of those lots that they use, but FDA does not consider that an adequate assurance of safety. And, fin quote, and finally, Mc McNeil rejected the products that it found to have, that, sorry, and finally, McNeil rejected the products that it found had excess active ingredient, end quote. Would you agree with that statement or disagree with that statement? Um, again, I would say I agree with the footnote. When they knew those particular lots, um, uh, had excess ingredients, they, they rejected them, but I think that we felt that um, they didn't test other parts of that area to be sure that there wasn't a problem in other uh, ingredient that was shipped. Now, my understanding is the let me just uh, Let me just see if Deb uh, sure. wants to qualify that. Yeah, just to clarify that, uh, with the potency issue, what happened was that McNeil made a change in their manufacturing process and the size of the vat they were using without testing whether the product would adequately mix once that change was made. So they produced 11 batches uh, using that new process. Three of them tested s to be super potent. They threw away those three, but from our perspective, there's no assurance that the other eight wouldn't have the same potency issues. They did some testing. They didn't find potency, but because the process hadn't been tested, there was potential that there were potency problems in the other batches, even though uh, they hadn't tested that way. It, it, I appreciate the efforts of the FDA, and, and, and I love the fact that they're ahead of the, ahead of the uh, uh, ball, but having found no serious adverse reaction, is the FDA overreacting to this? I mean, there are mm -hmm. 775 serious side effects. So where on the spectrum is this or what you're usually dealing with? How severe is this problem and issue? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there, uh, let me answer that in a couple ways. The, the side effects are, were reported about the medications, and we think that some of them were linked to the actual medications used, right. not the quality problems. Um, and I think the number of adverse events are, we probably have to separate a little bit from the quality problems. We consider that these quality problems to be quite significant, and we want to fix them before it becomes a point where we're counting the problem in hospitalizations and injuries instead of in bottles recalled. <laughs> the, uh, what's a mom supposed to do? You've had hundreds of millions of products recalled. Uh, how many of those have actually made it to somebody's, you know, beyond the store shelf and actually into somebody's cupboard and they're sitting there? What, what's mom supposed to do at home? Well, uh, we, we had some in our house. Um, I think uh, we, we, we recommend that people throw out the ones that they have, that you can find out which, which ones they are from uh, the website and other information, and that, that, what is, that they can go to the store and, and get alternatives. So if you have any of these products you're supposed to, on your shelf, you're supposed to actually go back to the store? Or is there a, when you say the website, how does that work? Is there a lot number on the bottom that they can go check on the FDA website? There is. Website? And yes. And I'm, I, you know, um, McNeil has actually set up a phone number for people to call to get instructions. And they, they may answer better the, how they're handling that part of it. But there are um, instructions for people to be able to uh, um, turn back their medication. 
and finally, were you at the meeting? Were you, either any of you at those meetings in February? No, I think that uh, uh, Ms. Otter um, was the one who called for the meeting, but I don't think any of us were at the meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you very much. I now yield um, five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. Uh, in your testimony, you referenced a 2010 report which identified a six-year-old child who died. Now, prior to uh, the child's death, uh, according to this report, the child had been given several products manufactured at the facilities in question. Mm -hmm. uh, did any of those products that the child uh, took contain a harmful bacteria? Um, not, no, as far as we know. Those were tested and we did not see any of the bacteria. And uh, what was the cause of death? I, I, uh, let me see. I have, I want to be sure whether we have this. I think that there's still an open coroner's investigation, so I'm not sure they have a final uh, cause of death. It, when, I, I, I may, when, it, it may have been the, um, when was the infection. Uh, January. Have you seen any toxicology screens from this uh, autopsy report. Have you seen the autopsy report? I'm not sure that we have the final autopsy report. That's what it would be, that if the coroner's investigation is open, we probably don't have the final report. I understand that, it, that there was this bacteria found in multiple um, tissues. Uh, of which the, of which the bacteria was found in the multiple tissues? Uh, Burkholia sepatia. And is that bac was that bacteria found in any of the samples at the FDA uh, picked up of the products that uh, were recalled? No. No. It, 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 that bacteria was not found in, in the products that this child apparently consumed. It was not found in any finished product that we know of, but it was the same bacteria that was involved in the, in the ingredient issue that the company had. So does the FDA have a pathologist on its staff? Um, I'm, I'm, I couldn't tell you 100 percent. Do, do you outsource uh, pathology reviews? Well, we do have medical officers who would be qualified to review pathology reports. Are they, are they certified, you know, in, uh, in terms of pathology? Are they pathologists or do they just review I'd have to get back to you on that exact question. But we do have people who, who are qualified to review pathology and, and judge um, whether or not uh, we were concerned about a link between a product and a particular death. Why was the report even included in testimony if it doesn't seem to rise to the level of significance uh, according to your uh, answers here? Well, I, I use it as an example of how seriously we take reports like this. I mean, we went out, we tested the products, we actually went back and reviewed the records um, uh, again at each of the facilities where uh, that were involved because they had taken products from the two facilities. and. You know, we don't reach it. It's really two lines of evidence that we use. One is our assessment of the manufacturing problem, and other is a thorough investigation of the adverse event reports that we get, and that was an example of one. Uh, when is something, uh, by your consideration, the result of an adverse event that's, in a, uh, that's a, uh, well understood to be a contraindication of, the, of taking of a drug, and on the other hand, uh, an adulterated product? How do you make the distinction? Um, it's a good question. It partly depends on the specific situation. So, for example, in some of the cases that were reported, there were toxic levels of the medicine, you know, uh, of a variety of medicines, in, um, and there's a history of the child maybe getting extra doses. That, that is a, a, a known problem for certain over-the-counter medicines. When you get the autopsy, will you get the autopsy report on the six-year-old child who, who died? Do you Will expect we? To get it? Oh yeah, I believe so. Sure. Will you can you share it with this committee? I'm 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 sure we would we would do that. Yes. And and could I ask you, uh, to your knowledge, does anyone who is at the FDA uh, have they ever gone over and worked for Johnson and Johnson or McNeil? Uh, is there anybody over there at uh, Johnson Johnson and McNeil who used to work for the FDA? Um, I couldn't say for sure, but I would guess probably there are people who have. And and is there anyone uh, at uh, uh, who used to work at Johnson & Johnson or McNeil, who now works for the FDA? I, have, uh, I don't know that for sure, but it's possible. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further questions. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, uh, just, to, just to be clear for the record, kind of picking up where uh, Mr. Chaffetz was, uh, the, the cause and effect, uh, has, has there been any determination that any adverse event was caused by product from McNeil or, or Johnson & Johnson? By the product, not the product quality issue. Um, yes, I believe that there are adverse events that are known to be caused by the product. There are a lot of adverse events that happen in medicine and often they're linked to the actual pharmaceutical itself because all medicines have risks and benefits, but not anything linked to the product quality issues that we're talking okay. about here. Okay. I just want to be clear on that. And have you looked at any of the recalled product? Have you tested that to see if there's the bad stuff in there, any of the, any of the product that's been taken off the shelf? Um, we did in the course of some of these investigations of individual adverse events, but generally, other than that, we, we generally don't do that. And, and, and why not? I mean, in this situation, why not? Well, we believe that um, if there needs to be a recall because of the testing that